Good afternoon and welcome to another live stream here on DreamBank's Facebook and LinkedIn page. My name is Andy Frisky. I'm a senior dream curator at DreamBank. Really excited to introduce the featured speaker today. But before we go ahead and do that, I'd like to welcome any first time viewers that are joining us. So a little bit of context as to who we are and why we are here. DreamBank is a free community resource that is put on by American Family Insurance. The whole reason why we exist is to help inspire people to pursue their dreams. And in large part, that's done through the programs that we offer. So we have 11 different event series uh, within the Dream Bank space um, that uh, range, again, the gamut. So this one happens to fall under our career series, so both career-seeking, career-advancing topics. I also manage our business-related event series. Uh, we have a Dream Big series, which is our inspiration, motivational wellness speaker series, a very robust crafting series, family-related activities, events in Spanish, just to name uh, a handful. Um, so if you're watching this on our Facebook page, go ahead and press that events tab. Uh, that'll give you a good concise list as to what we have upcoming in addition to everything that we have put out since uh, the end of March in 2020. But today I have Lori Gibson. Lori's going to be speaking on navigating change, tools for moving forward in uncertain times. So without further ado, I'm going to go ahead and kick it over to Lori. Lori, take it away. Excellent. Thank you, Andy. And thank you for all your help getting this um, set up. Um, very happy to be with all of you today. And um, it just, I was just talking with Andy just as a little bit of a preface here about when we started talking about this, um, it, and it was back in March, and um, they were already booked out until obviously August. Um, and we talked a little bit about that at the time. And I said, Well, you know, navigating change is a topic that's relevant. I, you, you know, this is material I've had and used in a number of organizations for many years. And, um, you know, in the moment that we were talking, it felt really extra relevant given COVID and the, all the changes that we've all been experiencing with that. And, um, and I will admit, and I think we talked about it, a little bit of like, oh, well, we'll probably be not maybe not through COVID by August, but I bet we'll be able to do this in person. That would be awesome. And so, um, no, here we are. <laughs> so, um, and so navigating change. And um, I think this topic, as I said, always timely in, in my opinion, for me personally, as well as for people I've worked with. Um, and, um, and now, again, probably more than ever, as we all sort of, and I like the term navigation, that's why I use that, of just, there's not one straight path necessarily it's kind of a combination of things and sort of figuring out the uncertainty. So glad to have you with us. Um, if you have questions, um, let me just tell you a couple of things about how to get the most out of the workshop today. Um, it is a little more of a presentation than a workshop just because of our format. Um, but feel free to do these things to kind of keep yourself engaged. Um, and um, one is kind of keep your fingers moving in the chat function. Um, if you have a comment to make or a question, um, I am not watching the chat because that gets very distracting as a presenter, um, but Andy is. And so if you do ask a question, I have told him to feel free um, to interrupt um, and just say, hey, there's a question, Lori, do you want to address it now? Um, or if he feels like that's something we could just save um, we'll take questions at the end as well, but feel free, please, to put them in the chat and ask as we go along. Um, and then I, I have this one in here, but I'm not sure with this presentation that this applies because you won't all be seeing each other. And I don't know that Andy would see you if you physically raised your hand. Um, so the chat function is probably the best way to, to make yourself known. Um, and so ask questions in the, in the chat, um, make comments. Um, share your experience if you've got an example of something we're talking about because others will be able to see that um, and benefit from that. Um, so those are just a couple of you know, ground rules for, um, for our time together. So the objectives for today, um, three things, uh, or four things actually. So one, we're, we're really gonna talk about and learn some specific behaviors um, and mindsets, which I know is a little bit fuzzier um, than behaviors, but behaviors and mindsets that help you deal with change. 
but also in, with ambiguity, because I feel like sometimes, and especially, you know, you think about things that are going on right now, um, it, we don't know always what a change is going to be. And it's that feeling, that ambiguity about it that can cause us some stress or that just create uncertainty. Um, so we're going to really talk about some specific things that I think are um, helpful and good behaviors to really look at and say, are those my strengths? Are there some of those that aren't my strengths, but I could work on that or I have people around me that have that. Um, so identifying some predictable reactions to change and how to recognize those in yourself and others. Um, that's the thing about um, that uncertainty is sometimes it doesn't feel like things are very predictable, but in reality, there are some pretty common reactions to change and, and we'll walk through that together. Um, you're gonna learn a tool, one specific tool that you can use um, for yourself um, or use with others to spark some good questions and discussion to help you plan for changes. And um, I have found it useful. I've used it with a lot of organizations and teams and even in one-on-one -on -one coaching. So we'll, we'll walk through that. Um, and then we're gonna end our time with talking a little bit about resilience and um, self-care because I think our ability to demonstrate those productive behaviors, to you know, have the right mindset, to deal with ambiguity and all of that um, has a lot to do with how well we care for ourselves and really pay attention to our resilience. Um, so I'm going to share some of that. Um, and some of what I will share in that area actually came from um, a health psychologist that I had the privilege of working with when I was at Meritor. Um, so when we get that far, I'll make sure that I credit, credit her for that information that she shared and then I have used um, a lot personally, as well as sharing in this format. So those are our objectives. That's what you can expect to get out of today. I realize you don't have a handout, but I hope that you have something handy that you can take some notes. And um, at the end, I'll give you my contact info. So if you do want a copy of anything, I'm happy to, uh, to get that to you. So let's kind of look at a couple of quotes here. These are two of my favorite quotes on change, and they actually go hand in hand. Um, so the first one is from Marilyn Ferguson, who is a futurist and author. It's not so much that we're afraid of change or so in love with the old ways, but it's that place in between that we fear. It's like being between trapezes. It's Linus when his blanket is in the dryer. There's nothing to hold on to. Um, and isn't that true? And I love that visual of you know, think about it, it, that visual of the trapeze first. Just, you know, I, I think about, you know, in an organizational setting as an example, you know, I'm doing my job, I kind of know what I'm doing, I've been here a little while, and then a change is announced, and, and somebody, even if they don't say it in this way in particular, they probably don't, um, says, well, just let go and grab this. Don't worry, you know, don't worry about it, just and, and if I'm swinging along, knowing what I'm doing, I'm confident, I have that confidence, which equates with competence, and somebody says, we're not going to do it that way anymore. It's human nature to go, Bleh, what? But, but what do I grab onto? And sometimes that's not clear. Um, and, and if you like the analogy better of sweet Linus, it's Linus when his blanket is in the dryer. It's like, okay, I had this security about what I was doing, what I knew, um, how things worked, what my daily routine was, and now that's different. And it's, it's gonna take me a minute or longer to kind of feel comfortable with that and to figure it out, to figure out the new way. And the reason I think that that happens is in the second quote, which is from Alfred North Whitehead, who's a philosopher, explorer. Um, we think in generalities, but we live in detail. And I'm gonna give you a very quick story. And this was, was from an organization I was in. Oh gosh, I can't even tell you how many years ago I've been in a number of them, <laughs> many years ago. And um, I, I worked in a department where um, we were, we were the basic like big floor with cubes, right? 
Um, I was I was privileged. I had not an office, but most people, you know, worked in in cubes. And um, one day our vice president called everybody together and with good news. Um, he was giving kind of a quarterly report of how the organization was doing. And we were growing like crazy at the time. It was doing really well financially. And everybody in those teams that were part of that, that floor were impacted by that because they were crazy busy. They were, you know, having a hard time in some cases keeping up because of the growth, because we hadn't really added staff. And so the good news about his announcement and the reason he brought us all together was the good news is we've been approved to hire um, some staff. And we know that'll create a little more work in the short term, but in the long term, we'll be able to meet these growth challenges and the extra work you've all been taking on, et cetera. So great news, right? Who wouldn't be happy about that? Then he threw in that because of that, um, it was going to be a little bit of inconvenience because we've been, we'd be doing some remodeling or construction on the floor. And um, to accommodate these extra people, we would be reducing the size of cubes by two square feet. Imagine that if you're... And that was what people all of a sudden went, wait, what? But I don't have enough room for everything. You know, cubes are, I don't have enough room for my files now. I'm tripping over things. I, what does that mean? And I actually, after the meeting, saw a guy go back to his cube and sort of, he had a probably foot long feet, maybe. I don't know. He was stepping that off to see what that really meant. And he was not happy. I share that example just as such a perfect illustration of what these two quotes mean for us. I may think something is even a good idea. I support that decision or I understand why we need to do it this way. And then when I really start to try to think about it and we need to implement it or I need to learn something new or whatever it might be or my space is going to change, that's when the reality sets in. So we think in generalities, but we live in detail. And I think that's an important thing to kind of keep in mind, A, that that's common, and B, that that impacts how we deal with change and ambiguity, whether that's personal change or organizational change. And I always love to throw in this quote because I think we, and some of you may have seen this before, but it, especially these days, we hear the term unprecedented, um, which certainly COVID is, unpre you know, a pandemic is unprecedented, but we hear that term a lot about just the changes, the decisions, the, the sort of back and forth that goes on. Um, and so I think this term VUCA, that we live in a VUCA world, it's volatile, it's uncertain, it's complex, and it's ambiguous. And I don't know if you can see down at the bottom, I have this, this quote credited and, and use this to say, yes, it is. Our current world is a VUCA world. And this term was originally actually coined back in the early 1990s um, by the US military. So I, I use that, it makes me smile a little bit because I think we can do this. We've been through tough things before and I know you know that, but it's always a good reminder that okay, if I stop, if I'm intentional about how I'm dealing with the changes, if I take care of myself, you know, I've done, I've made changes before, I've worked with others to make things work, we can do this. Um, so I like that reminding ourselves that, yep, we're in a VUCA world and we can do this. So, and that last one on the VUCA is ambiguous. And so, when I was doing this internally in a couple of organizations, this was often something that was part of our leadership development curriculum. And so we would always try to tie things to um, key competencies. Um, and in this case, the most obvious one is the key competency of dealing with ambiguity. And I find that this, this list um, Again, it makes it more tangible. So what are the actual competencies or skills 
that I have that help me deal with change and navigate? Um, and what are some others that maybe people around me are better at than I am and I can take advantage of that? Or that maybe I can develop, I can learn, I can do a little reading or whatever, so that I, I don't have to be great at all these things, but it's helpful to know what those skills are, I think. So one, and maybe it's an obvious one, is, is a key competency in dealing with ambiguity is effectively coping with change. So knowing how a change impacts me and, and having the skills, having the coping skills um, to, to deal with that. That I can shift gears comfortably, which if you've ever done anything with communication styles or you've done DISC or Myers-Briggs or anything like that, you know that depending on your style, that can be really easy for you. That can be really hard for others. So I think it's important to see that as a skill um, and also to realize that if I'm really good at that, I need to remember that not everybody is. So I might be saying, oh, come on, people, this is going to be fine. And others are going, oh, I don't know. They're, they're, they're swinging by that trapeze. So I need to be sensitive to that. Um, can decide and act without having the total picture. You know, we need to do that so often, um, anytime. Um, but in particular, when things are kind of changing, when things are a bit ambig ambiguous, I need to be able to decide something and I need to feel comfortable saying that was the right decision at that time. And now we know more. I mean, we hear this all the time in our world right now. As science learns, we, ch we make changes in how things are, are addressed. And, and that just makes sense. So deciding and acting without having the total picture and then being willing to say, OK, we've learned more. And here's what, what we can do now or what I will do now. Um, is it upset when things are up in the air? Again, that ambiguity I realize is a reality, and so I do what I need to do to cope with that. Um, doesn't have to finish things before moving on. That one always kind of make, makes me personally laugh because anyone who knows me knows I don't probably have the attention span to finish things before moving on to something else. <laughs> Multitasking is my thing, and... Um, Again, communication style wise, um, I, I don't have to finish things. As a matter of fact, I prefer to start something and then do something else and then come back to it. And, and so not everybody's like that. Um, so we need to understand that. Can comfortably handle risk and uncertainty. Again, that, that's sort of a no brainer. Um, communicates a compelling and inspired vision or sense of core purpose. I, I think particularly in organizations, this one is so important for us to think about. And if any of you are in leadership roles, um, one of the things, so I, I most recently was at Mariner. And when we um, were, when we merged with, I don't know if that's the right word to use, but that's the one I'm going to use, um, with Unity Point Health in Iowa. That was a few years ago. And it was things like that are always scary for people, right? As an organization, we have a culture, we have a sense of purpose, we have a vision here, and we don't want to lose that. And I was so impressed at the time that our leaders really emphasized that. Um, our core purpose hasn't changed. Our mission as a community hospital hasn't changed. Um, and it's just as compelling as ever. And as a matter of fact, when you compare it to Unity Point Health, look how similar it is because they're community based as well. So it, it was that kind of thing. And so I'll use a few like organizational examples that I've lived through where personally I found that helpful because people were concerned about that when a change like that takes place. Um, keeps expe expectations in check. Um, so I, you know, again, I think the more changes you've been through in life, the easier this becomes that you realize that, okay, this, this may or may not work. We can learn some lessons or it could change again. And the more you've been through, I think keeping those expectations of what's going to happen and all of that in check are a little, maybe a little bit easier. Talks about possibilities. Um, again, I may not know everything, but what could this look like? Um, can I be that optimist about 
what's going on here and where we could head. And maybe this change, and I've heard people talk about this. I'm going to use COVID. I'll promise not to overuse it as our example, but we're living in it. Um, but I've heard so many people share lessons learned where even though the whole thing was super hard, they learned this or they learned how to do something or whatever. And so that was a good thing. I never would have thought about that, or I never would have done that, or I never would have learned how to make sourdough bread um, if it hadn't been for this. Um, and so I can take those things and, and make a positive out of those. And then finally, being optimistic. Um, my favorite quote about optimism, and I probably should have had the visual here, but you can picture um, somebody sitting with a glass of wine, um, and you've, you may have seen this quote. My favorite quote is, um, people who talk about, the is the glass half full or is the glass half empty, have it wrong. The glass is refillable. Um, that's the true optimistic view <laughs> of this. So those are some key things. I'm gonna pause for a moment and just let you kind of look at that list. And if you do have a spot to take notes, um, make note of maybe those, you know, two, three or so that are your greatest strengths. Um, and maybe make note of a couple where you think, yeah, I don't, I don't really do that as well, but maybe you could work on it. Maybe you know somebody who does. Um, so let's just kind of pause for a moment and, and take a couple notes for yourself to personalize this. Hey, Angela, while folks are doing, excuse me, Lisa, while folks are doing that, Angela has a question. Okay, uh, and it's Lori. Um, so Angela states that, um, they feel like uh, the further you get from the exec team, the harder it is to see how your daily work fix, fits into the core purpose of the organization. Yes. What tips do you have for making sure purpose trickles down to the front line? Yes. So um, a couple of things that I don't have the be all. Thank you, Angela, for that question. Um, I don't have the, the be all end all answer to that, but a couple of ideas. Um, one is, and, and I'll, again, I'll use a, a Meritor example, but I actually back in my days at um, TDS Telecom, we did this as well. I've always been involved with performance management, performance evaluations. Um, and one of the things that I think can be done is to take that, those values um, or that vision and actually make it tangible in performance reviews. So have people do a self-evaluation and give some examples of how they contribute to that. Um, so I'll just, I'll just use Meritor as an example. Um, TDS is too long ago, I don't remember what, the, what they were, but, but with Meritor, for example, um, foster unity, own the moment. Those were a couple of, of our values. And so I could give examples um, in a nurse in a unit um, somebody in environmental services, a VP, anyone could give an example of what do you specifically do to foster unity, to create teamwork, to, you know, there was a definition of what foster unity meant. Um, so that's one very sort of systematic way that I think we can bring core purpose, values, that kind of thing to life um, in the organization at every level. Um, I also think giving tools to leaders at every level to be able to talk about it and share. So another example, um, if you're in an organization where you do um, training for leaders um, and you're rolling out, you know, new things or whatever, give them the information first and give them a toolkit of or just talking points that they are expected not asked, but expected to go back and share in their team. So here's the change. We're going to give you, you know, a heads up on it. Um, and here's some key points we want you to take back to your team and share and then generate some conversation about how they will be impacted by it, get their feelings, whatever. Um, so that's another way that that can do, um, that that can be done, I think. Um, so that's just a couple of ideas. I hope I hope that's helpful, Angela, and others who might have been thinking that. Are there any other questions, Andy, that you're seeing or co or comments? 
None right now. Okay. Um, let's move on then. Hopefully you had a chance to sort of take a look as I was um, talking about that question and um, and see what you think about these and what your strong points are, what you can, because sometimes we don't realize what we're already good at. So I think that's always important to look at. So this is um, one of the core pieces when, when the promise was that you would get a couple of good tools that you could use for yourself and with others, um, this is certainly one of them. Um, it may look somewhat familiar because it's basically um, based on a combination of the, the famous and old and still well used um, stages of grief model that Elizabeth Kubler-Roth um, wrote about and created. Um, and so there's the stages of grief that I think most of us are familiar with, even if we don't have it memorized, but we know that that exists, right? And we, that they are typical reactions. Um, and then more recently, there's a gentleman named John Fisher, um, who is an expert in, in my field, which is organizational development and leadership. Um, and he um, has this a process of transition model that he writes about. Um, and it's a lot more organizationally based and it's a lot more detailed. As a matter of fact, almost too detailed um, in some case, not too detailed to use, but to, to really like make real for people I was finding as I tried to use it. So this model is actually, um, I'm not arrogant enough to call it the Gibson model, but this is basically a hybrid that I put together that uh, quite a few years ago and just, and have used Personally, I've used it to kind of remind myself of if I'm feeling a certain way or, or whatever, that these are very human and typical and kind of predictable responses to, to change. Um, and I've also used it with teams. Um, when I would give this as a handout in teams that were going through a big change, I would have people, and you might want to think about this, think about a change you're going through. Um, and I would have people, um, you know, put a little star or a sticky dot or something on this model to say, you know, here's where I am. Um, and then oftentimes teams would take, you know, we'd put it on a flip chart, teams would take it back to their unit and put it up in if they had a little break room um, and they could, you know, write their initials on it and let people know. And I think the power in that is one sort of cleaning it for yourself. And here's where I'm at with this change that's going on but also to see that everybody is somewhere different and that's okay. Not everybody is as far along in this reaction as I am. Some people are still kind of frustrated. And so to help us as a, when we're doing this as a team to kind of better understand those different human reactions to change that people are going through um, is, is really, I think, one of the most valuable pieces of this but also to understand that this is a typical model, typical reactions to change. So I'm just gonna talk briefly, I know you can read, um, but I wanna give a couple of examples. Um, so one is just sort of shock or surprise at the event being announced. Now this model um, tends to be more geared to changes that are imposed on us. So there, there's really, generally two types of change. There's imposed change and there's chosen change. So I might make decide to make a change in my life. Um, that doesn't make it easy. And I still go through some of these things, but it's particularly tr true if we're thinking about this in an organizational setting. And again, I go back to my example of the good news is we're growing. The bad news is your cube isn't. Um, <laughs> that was what? And then people, you started people pretty quickly going through these reactions, typical reactions to change. So oftentimes there's a little bit of a denial that, yeah, you know what? We've heard this before. I, it's never actually come to fruition. It's never, I, I've been here for 15 years. They said like, it was probably 12 years ago we were gonna do this, it never happened. Have you ever heard that in your organization? Have you ever said it? Um, so sometimes the first reaction is sort of denial. Then there is frustration because as I realize like, oh, oh, 
you're serious. This is really going to happen. And just that recognition that perhaps this is bigger than I thought, or I'm not thrilled with it, but it looks like we really are going to do this. And then it moves pretty quickly down into, if you follow that blue line down into that dip, um, there's often fear. Um, what impact is this really going to have on me? And we're going to look in a couple minutes at some typical resistance to change behaviors. And that's what's impacting those. There's, there's a fear um, that comes into play very often. And, and if you look at the other side of that model and you see that solid line that's anger, that kind of that we need to be so careful of, particularly in teams, um, is that my fear turns to I'm just angry about this. And if if somebody just sees my anger and maybe I've even lashed out at somebody or maybe I'm just being cranky or whatever it is in a team. Oftentimes what I found in my work through the years with teams is sometimes people just like I need to figure this change out for myself and I don't have the energy to deal with you and your anger. You just, you know, I can't. And instead, what I always encourage people to do is instead of turning a back on it, take a step forward. Um, because what that person may need most at that time is somebody to say, how are you doing? What's up? I said, you know, and that can be a coworker. It doesn't have to be a leader. Um, and sometimes that's, and so giving somebody that space to say, this really ticks me off, or I can't believe we're going to do, or maybe they might even be brave enough to say this, this kind of scares me because I don't know if I'm going to like it. I don't know if I'm going to be able to do this. We've changed too much. I'm stressed. I can't do anymore. It, step into it versus stepping away because what happens too often is that anger about the change doesn't get addressed and people either dip down to that depression, that low mood, that again, typical part of the change model. Or if you follow that, that dotted line that goes up, that anger can turn to disillusionment and people say, I'm just, I'm just out. This isn't for me. And sometimes that's okay. Um, sometimes people will choose to leave because they don't like this change. That's their prerogative. And sometimes that's not a bad thing for that individual and or for the team. Um, so that can happen. But the other dotted line that you see there, that other gold dotted line is hostility. That anger can just turn into hostility. And what that looks like is somebody saying, well, I'll make it work, but I'm still angry. And people do what I call quit and stay. That's when we run into troll in teams is I have people who are angry and no one's really addressed it or held people accountable for it. And they're hostile. They'll make it work, but they're still angry. And then they're impacting the, the morale in the, in the team. So though that, that line is, is so important to pay attention to if you see that in yourself or in others. Um, and then as we just continue on the, the curve that we're all familiar, more familiar with is, again, I think everybody has it, sort of that low mood, lacking in energy. Um, the way to kind of recognize that in, in people, in yourself, if you hear yourself do this, um, or in others, in team members, is when you hear people say, whatever, just, just tell me what to do or something, some variation thereof, the whatever. It's just, it's really an ind indication that somebody's at that stage. And then hopefully <laughs> they take the right steps or the right things are done to continue to engage people that they start moving up. And to the next piece is gradual acceptance. So that's kind of the, okay, well, maybe this isn't so bad. Maybe this will work after all. I'll, I'll put my toe in the water. I'll, I'll test the waters. Um, I'm still kind of sitting back a little bit maybe, but well, yeah, I guess, you know, I'll go to that training and I'll see what I think and whatever it might be, it's gradual acceptance. And then once we get into that, we have the ability then to start to move forward, um, learning how to adapt, 
um, and function in that new situation, whether that's a new software, whether that's a new department structure, whether that's a new leader, whatever that organizational change is. Um, and I'm starting to feel more positive because I can kind of see myself in the future. And um, I'm learning and I'm okay, I, okay. And I might have some successes under my belt that give me the confidence to move on. Because I said it earlier, confidence and competence go like that. So if I'm not feeling competent, I'm not feeling real confident in this change. And then hopefully integration changes um, are integrated, you know, new renewed individual. I, I feel like, okay, whew, we did this and we learned and we, you know, and I think one of the things when we have people at all different levels of this is just that patience with one another, asking a lot of good questions. And we're going to talk a little bit more about that. Um, and just recognize using this, um, again, I, as I said, I've had teams that have said they've used this, they've put it up in their break room and had people make notes on it or put little post-its to say, here's where I am today. And then, or they talk about it in a team meeting. Um, and it's such a valuable thing to bring out in the open and say, Everybody goes through all of this and it's okay to, to talk about it. And that sometimes in and of itself helps. A um, couple of additional things on this, and then I'll see if there's any questions on it. Um, one is there's no time frame. I might go through this depending on the change in like an hour. Um, I might, it, depending on the change, if it's a huge thing and it's going to take us a while to work through it, figure it out. We could be going through this for a long time, for you know, a month, a year, as an, as a department or an organization. Hopefully, not a whole year, but it could take that long if it's huge. Um, and the other thing to recognize, and I wish I knew the name of this this carnival ride, because I can move along, and maybe I'm at gradual acceptance, let's say, or moving forward, and then something happens. And instead of taking the next step forward, I find myself going back, um, maybe even back to that depression of like, oh, are you kidding me now? Um, how many of you have felt that way lately? <laughs> I have. Um, and so it's not a constant move forward. So also don't think there's something wrong with you or with others around you. you need to kind of keep checking in because it can really, and it reminds me of the, like, not a roller coaster, but there's that carnival ride that just kind of goes back and forth like this. I don't know what that's called. It would make me sick. Um, but that's what it reminds me of is it really can go back. So it's not a static, predictable step forward all the time. Um, and that's okay too. We just have to be aware of it and keep moving. Um, I'm going to give you a personal example of, of when I actually pulled this out um, in, and kind of looked at it. Um, I retired early from Meritor in the end of 2019, um, which, which feels like five years ago instead of less than two. Um, and I was getting to the point um, in early March of last year that I was almost too busy. I was doing a little bit of consulting. I do a lot. I volunteer at the River Food Pantry. I was volunteering at Meritor. Um, I was doing a lot of hiking. I was planning some trips. I had just been back from a trip with my husband. All of that, like life is good. And I almost felt like I was like, okay, I need to like slow down a little bit. And I had literally just said to my husband, um, you know, I think when the weather gets a little bit nicer, because this was early March, when the weather gets a little bit nicer, I think I'm going to start saying no to some things and just like enjoy being outdoors a little bit more, do some yard stuff, you know, do a little more hiking and whatnot. And in a classic case of be careful what you ask for, literally over the next two days, two days, everything I was doing was canceled. And I remember sitting like right here where I'm sitting right now and getting the final email about a volunteer, about volunteer work I was doing at Meritor. Um, and they were eliminating volunteers because of COVID. And I, I literally sat here and cried for about 10 minutes and thought, wow, after like 38 years of being useful, 
as of today, it doesn't really matter if I get up in the morning, does it? That is a classic, like low mood depression. I was in that dip it, just like that. Um, and thankfully, because of, I think, my mindset, what just who I am, that was about 10 minutes. And then I started to go, okay, well, if that's true, what am I going to do? And let's, let's like start thinking about, and so I was into that gradual and I'm not saying I'm perfect at this because I've, trust me, not done it this well, but it's just such a strong example in my mind, just personally, when sometimes this happens like that, um, when it's a change that just impacts us so strongly and boom, there we are. Um, so even pulling this out and kind of reminding ourselves, okay, this is normal, this low mood, this like, who am I thing? It's right there. Um, okay, now what do I want to do about that? So I'll stop there. Uh, this is, this is, I think, one of the most powerful tools that, that you can have um, when you're thinking about change and working with others on it. Um, so let me pause again and say, Andy, any, any questions, anything to share? Yeah, um, another question came in. So um, this person states, I've been in so many change situations where the leadership has been planning the change for so long and they've moved through the whole spectrum of emotions with the change, yet they forget that staff is hearing this for the first time. Yes. Empathy goes a long way in helping others embrace change. What have and you seen that helps people move forward instead of backwards? Yes, and that that's one of the reasons that I think... Um, this was such a powerful model to share, not only in leadership workshops that I would do, um, because what I would do with this, and you can feel free to use it this way, um, is I would have leaders, you know, on their own handout of it, um, you know, identify like one change, because we're all going through multiple changes at the same time, but identify that one big change that's going on in your team. Um, and where are you? Um, put a like literally put a sticky dot on this model where you are and not surprisingly as I would you know wander around and see where people would put their dots usually they were at the you know on the upswing right and then I would have them think about someone in their team that they have sensed is or maybe they know for sure is really struggling with this um, maybe has been angry or just acting uncharacteristically silent, or maybe has just said, I'm kind of pissed off. I don't really like this or <laughs> whatever. Um, we're take another dot and put that person on the, the and of course, they're always <laughs> further back. Um, and to narrow it to just for a workshop setting, just that just one person, because your whole team's everywhere. Um, and then start talking about so how do you how do you step in? And we'll, we'll talk about um, some of those, some of those ideas, but I think basically it's first just recognizing it um, and not expecting people to get where you are without the same kind of time to process time for information, et cetera. And I'm a big believer in leaders um, who just state the obvious out loud and say, I know that this is um, news to you and you know it's not news to me because we've been working behind the scenes. I, I've worked through some of my initial reactions to it. And so I really want to kind of open some discussion to say, you know, what are your, what are your initial reactions? What are some of your questions? What are, and just lead some discussion. Maybe you don't have to have answers for everything. I think that's another thing that's important for a leader to know. You don't have to be the answer person on it, but, you know, use a flip chart or a whiteboard and write down those questions. Um, you don't have to feel pressured to answer them, but record it. Um, another thing I've seen some people, some leaders do is again, Take that, and if there's a common area that you have for your team, um, put that up and let people add to it, um, and then bring it back when you have team meetings to say, okay, here's some questions that have come in. Um, here's some concerns people are having. Um, maybe even have a separate one that has some success stories on it. Um, what are people learning? What did they figure out? What did how you know? And have some discussion around those. Um, so yes, great point to remind ourselves of that we're all at different places um, and we need to recognize those that, that are um, 
you know, are just hearing about this or just getting that chance to respond, they're not going to be where I am. Of course, of course they're not. So how do I show empathy for that? How do I really help bring people um, along, ask what they need? Um, do they need training? Do they need more information? Do they just need time to think about it and process? I'll leave myself open for, for questions. If you have questions as we go along, um, those kinds of things. So just hopefully that helps. Anything else? All right, hearing none. So this, I'm, I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on this, but I, I like to bring it up because again, I think we, we sometimes easily label people resistant to change. Um, and if we don't get behind the, resist, the reasons for that resistance, um, we're never going to be able to help even ourselves. Like, so why am I so stuck with that? Why am I resisting this so much and being able? And so I'm actually just going to recommend that you either Google it or I can send it to you if you reach out to me. Um, it's from an article called Managing the Human Side of Change um, by Rosabeth Moss Cantor. And she goes through these reasons for resistance and really define. So I'm going to actually forgive my lack of eye contact for a moment because I want to take a look at a couple of notes that I've made on these to just sort of clarify them real quickly for you. Um, so one reason for resistance is people just feel a loss of control. I mean, that is the definition of stress, right? Is we've always heard that like lack of control is what causes stress. And so those go hand in hand. So if I'm just, this is a change that is an imposed change, if you remember that term from earlier, um, recognizing that people are gonna feel like, well, wait a second, I didn't have input on that or nobody asked me, um, or even if it's an individual change, um, something happened, um, like my example of like, poof, poof, everything I was doing went away. I, I, that was stressful, right? Um, excess uncertainty. So it goes back to that idea of ambiguity and those skills, those competencies. How do we help deal with the ambiguity and the uncertainty for people? Um, surprise! <laughs> That's that, you know, beginning of the curve is, wait, what? I didn't know we were even talking about doing that. Like that takes, you know, th change often takes us by surprise. I didn't expect that. I didn't know that was going to happen. So how do we how do we just, again, ask about that, recognize that, give people information if they need it, give them time. Um, the difference effect. Um, think about how much of your day um, is just really routine and habit. Um, and it, it doesn't, it's not a bad thing. We do so much out of habit. And that's how our work life is too. And now something has happened that takes the familiar and I've got to think about how I'm going to do it now. That's that's tiring. Um, and it it I have to be more conscious of it, et cetera. So sometimes just the difference effect is my reason for resistance. Like, wait a second. And then that, I think, ties into the next one, loss of face. Um, I've been in different organizations long enough to have heard so many times, um, well, what was wrong with the way we were doing it? We've been very successful doing it this way. We've done, been doing it this way for 10 years. No one ever had a problem with it before. Ever heard that? That's that loss. Of, that's that's the what people are saying outside when inside they're thinking, well, were, were we wrong? Because we didn't, you know, like I'm kind of offended by it. So loss of face is one. Um, concerns about future competence. Again, what if I can't do this? Um, I, I remember this was many, many years ago. And I think my friend Trish is is on this, um, this webinar. Um, she was a trainer for a brand new system. Um, this was back in the TDS days. And it was five full days of training out in our, our TDS business offices when they had the small telephone companies. Um, and long story short, um, that concern about future competence was so real. 
And I know that there were things that she had to do in that training because people would go back after five days. They were on the new, it was a billing system. They were on the new system when they went back to their, their office. Can you imagine? So I always think of that one when I think about concerns about competence. What if I can't do this? Um, that's real. And maybe they will stumble and maybe they will decide, I don't think I want to do this. Um, and and that can that can happen too. So again, just understanding that resistance isn't a bad thing. I need to ask some questions, try to understand so that maybe we can help ourselves and others through it. Um, there's ripple effects. So life is impacted by changes that happen at work um, all the time. Um, a schedule change. Well, I'm sorry, I dropped my kids off at daycare or you want me to work at home and my kids are home for school. Ooh, uh, right? That there's ripple effects. Um, sometimes a change does mean more work. I mean, we just, that's just a fact. And so we need to, again, be empathetic about that and recognize it. Um, there might be past resentments about how change. Yeah, we tried that 10 years ago. It didn't work then. Not going to work. It's a little bit, um, we talked about that just a little earlier, but sometimes past resentment about how changes have been handled. And then the last one, sometimes the threat is real. This there are people whose jobs will be impacted by this change. And that's the reality. And so how do I have empathy for that? How do I have those conversations, et cetera? So I'm not going to go into this in quite as much detail because I have one more tool I really want to, to talk through. But I, I feel like I'm remiss if I don't include um, this slide as just, again, different ways to think about how change impacts different people differently. Um, and for more on this and a little bit more detail on it, the article is amazing. In another um, kind of one of those, we, we can do this moments, however, um, when you, if you do Google the article or if you do get a chance to read it, um, I believe that the date of the article is on it. And if it's not, I'll give you a, a spoiler alert. It's from 1987. Yes, I've been doing this a long time. <laughs> but when you read the article, if you read the first paragraph, you'll think, oh, yeah, oh, my gosh, she's nailed it. And that article is from that long ago. So we're human. Change is constant. Change is always going to be happening. And our human reactions to it, I guess the good news is, are also pretty consistent and pretty predictable. And so that helps us, I think, realize, OK, I'm, I'm not. There's not something wrong with me that I'm resistant to this. I just need to identify it. I need to kind of figure out how to work through it. Maybe I need to ask for help or maybe I need to give help to somebody else. Um, so it's been around for a long time. So next, I want to talk, and it, it kind of goes along with that. When I see those, those pieces of resistance, um, here's a little. I mentioned a couple of these things, but there are the emotional reactions. So what are some things that I can do to really help, to really help intervene and maybe help somebody along, or at least know that somebody's empathizing? One is to listen, ask open-ended questions, give them some time, say, you know, again, back to just the, how are you doing? Um, and use what, what I call reflective listening, which I didn't make that up, but used it for years. And the definition of reflective listening is that the listener briefly, has to be brief, states in his or her own words, the core of what the speaker has communicated. Um, so sometimes I think we get caught in our habits with listening and in situations like this where it's an emotional situation and I'm trying to be helpful to somebody, the things that aren't helpful are, mm-hmm, okay, yep, oh, I hear you. Mm-hmm. That happened to me once. Mm-hmm. Yeah. How many times do we do that? And we think we're listening because I'm making eye contact and I'm saying I'm nodding. I'm doing all those nonverbals that say I'm listening. And how many times have you've done that and you've walked away and you think I have no idea what they just said? It happens to all of us. Reflective listening forces. If I really have to I, I just ask you an open-ended question and I'm reflectively listening to you well enough that I can briefly state, and sometimes I even have to interrupt somebody. If they're really on a roll, 
I want to be able to, to do this reflective listening. Um, and I don't want to wait to the end necessarily. So I can even politely, we've been taught not to interrupt, but I think when I'm using reflective listening, it's okay to say, I'm going to interrupt you for just a moment. So is your main concern X, Y, Z? That's briefly stating in my own words, I'm not repeating back, I'm not parrot phrasing, the core of what they've communicated to me so far. And the reason I'm asking it the way I am is they can say yes or no. They might say, if I have caught the right message, they might say, yes, yes, you've got it. They, and people will feel a sense of realness. Okay, all right, tell me more. Um, or they might say, no, no, that's not quite it. I have still been helpful because if I walk away thinking that that was what they were trying to tell me and that wasn't correct, um, that I need to know that. But also I've helped them maybe clarify for themselves a little bit that this is how I'm making it sound, but in reality, this is the issue. Um, so use reflective listening. Empathize, you know, that came up in with Angela's question of just in situations like this, empathy is, is so valuable. Um, and I, again, especially if on the change curve, I'm in a different place than you, um, I really have to be aware that you are struggling with this or your reaction to this is really different than mine. And it, it must be, it sounds like this is really hard for it, hard for you. Um, and it sounds like this is really stressful. And that's my reflective listening. It doesn't mean I'm stressed. Um, and it doesn't mean I have to feel that, but I can empathize with somebody. Try redirecting. And again, you're not interrupting, but if you can, again, once I've reflectively listened and gotten the yes, ask an open-ended open -ended question. So tell me more is the most obvious open-ended question I could ask. Tell me more about that. Or has this been going on for a while? Um, tell me when this first started for you and what the impact has been or whatever. I'm just making that up. Um, maybe reframe a little bit. If appropriate, and only if it feels appropriate, maybe suggest a positive action. So if I really know that, oh, you know, I, I felt that way too, and I went to the, the class that they're having, and I really found that helpful. I got a lot of my questions answered. You might want to think about that. Um, or I spent a little bit of time on the, the materials and just made some notes and then went and asked some questions. So that's what I mean by suggested. Don't tell people what's going to work for them, but maybe suggest here's something that worked for me and you might want to try it. And, and then it's their choice. Um, and one of the things I think is important too is just don't get sucked in. So you're there to help them. And again, that's the difference between empathy and, sy and sympathy sometimes, or just like getting into the ain't it awful kind of conversation. So maintain control and remember why you're there to help them and don't get sucked in. And then last, again, stay focused on, so what are their expectations in the situation? What are the overall, what are some potential solutions? See if you can help somebody come up with some ways to some steps to take um, that will help them maybe move along and ask, is there anything I could do to be helpful? Um, is there anything I can can provide or um, do you want to meet again and just check in? I'm happy to do that. So you don't have to be a leader to do that. You can be a friend. You can be a coworker. Um, and so I think those those are the ways that we deal with. Um, whoops, sorry. Wrong button um, with those typical reactions, those resistance um, pieces that we see. All right, how are you doing on time? One more tool. Um, this is the other real helpful tool, I think, but let me pause again. Um, one, if you've been looking at your screen the whole time, um, there I didn't do 20, 20, 20, because it's been more than 20 minutes, um, but just look away for a moment, maybe stand up, maybe stretch. We're on the home stretch, so I'll model for you how to stretch. <laughs> <laughs> Grab a quick glass of water, which I will do while you're doing. 
Andy, anything, um, any questions, comments that have come in? Nope, you're, you're looking good so far. Okay. Um, so this is um, a model that I have used for so long and used in uh, my back in the day when I was working with some other consultants and my friend Diane and I would, would use this. Um, and it's one of those that I would love to give credit for, but I've used it for so long that I, I have no idea where I got it and I don't know what it's called. Um, I call it the ball up the hill tool um, affectionately because that's kind of the model behind it. So if you look at the little visual there, um, I'm going to, you can, again, you can read. So I'm gonna, just going to give you a quick explanation of this. So if I'm, I have done this individually. I use this myself when I was thinking about um, leaving an organization I was in and going into my own consulting business. I've been in consulting twice, once with other partners for about seven years. And then right before Meritor, I was in, just had my own um, for two years. And I love both internal and external stuff. So I've been, been, I've been around. Um, but what I did is I thought, well, practice what you preach. Kind of think through this because it was a scary prospect. It's one thing to go with partners that are already experienced, but to just do this on my own. Um, and so I used this. I, I printed myself a handout of, the chain, of this ball up the hill tool. And in the middle, I wrote, become an independent consultant. And then I just started listing things. So the, the components of this, the momentum. So as you know, that ball is sitting there, what are the things that are driving toward this change? Um, what's the momentum? What's the reason behind it? What are the positives about it? And just you make note of those. So if you're doing it yourself, you just write your own notes. What are the positives? What am I excited about? Um, what's driving me toward this? Um, and then on the other side, and this is where the ball up the hill kind of analogy comes into play. If I have all these positive things working with me, working in my favor, and I'm pushing that ball up the hill, it's looking good, but I don't deal with the resistance to it that's pushing back. It's I'm never going to get there. It's going to continue to push. And so I have to look at okay, if I'm really going to be able to do this, what's the resistance? What could get in my way? Um, what are some potential barriers? What am I concerned about um, or uncertain about? Um, what, and there's so many things that could come into play there. Um, you know, finances, for me personally, you know, finances. Will I like working alone? I'm a very social person. Um, do I have the technology at home to be able to really make this work? There are, you know, all the kinds of things, but think about that as a, as a department or as a team, if you were using this, what are the potential barriers? Again, it might be skills. Are we going to have the tools that we really need? We might need to upgrade some equipment. Are they going to do that for us to make this work? All kinds of things that could be resistance. And if I don't identify and deal with those, then my, I'm not going to be able to get that ball up the hill. And then underneath it, if I, I might have all the momentum in the world and I might deal with the resistance, but if you really continue with that analogy, if I don't have the support needed to sustain that change long-term, it's going to go, it's still going to fall flat. Um, and that's why now, I don't know if this is an updated statistics. This is the statistic I've always heard is that 75% of organizational changes fail. And the reason they fail is that third piece that you know, we figure out the momentum, we deal with resistance to it, we implement something, but we don't spend enough time on what is the support needed to really sustain the change successfully. What will we need? Will we need to, to we, we need new skills. Maybe we need new tools. Maybe we need systems. Maybe we need a policy. We need training. We need accountability for people to do it the new way. Um, and so that's the, the tool, um, I've used it and get as specific as you can, the note that that's at the bottom there so that you can really use this then to build a change plan, whether it's for you individually, I've used it one-on-one -on -one in coaching with people who are going through a change and, and kind of help them talk through it and create their own, um, plan. I've used it in teams. 
um, had big leadership teams use it like in small groups and then share. Um, so it's a really versatile kind of tool to really help the thinking process become more tangible, the planning process become more tangible. And if you do it as a team, it really helps people feel engaged. So back to the question earlier about the fact that you know leaders have sometimes been working on an organizational change for a long time, and then they introduce it and people go, wait, what? This tool could really help with that. And if it's done, let's say your senior team does it with their next level direct reports. And then that group is asked to go do this with their supervisory team. And then their supervisors are asked to do it with their individual members. And they share that back and forth. Um, think about the power of just that. Um, and, and especially that last piece of here's what the team is saying they feel they'll need. And we may not know everything at this point, but we can always, again, make it a living document and use it as we make move through a change. So if it's brand new to everybody, this would be an awesome way to get people engaged in the conversation and really thinking about it together. So, um, and then I have to, to throw this in, my friend Paul Wesselman, who a lot of people may know, um, I just had to throw this in because I came across this postcard um, that, he, that I got from him just yesterday as I was finalizing my slides and I thought, oh, I've got to throw this in because it's so true. After all that planning, remember, you don't always need a plan. <laughs> Sometimes you just need to breathe, let go and see what happens. And so that's going to lead us into our final piece on just paying attention to our own self-care and resilience. Um, so Andy, before I go there, anything coming through? So um, Beth uh, had a question um, st stating, you know, or asking you uh, to speak more about uh, coaching them through change when there's no formal plan. But I think that you might have addressed some of that um, okay. in, in the last slide there. Okay, good. Um, yeah. And if I didn't enough, bring it up again at the end, Beth. Sure. Other than that, uh, nothing else. Okay, good. So again, we'll, with, we'll go into just a little bit of this idea of, and I'm a big believer in, you know, one of the things that gives us that ability to be resilient in the face of change and to kind of use these tools and help ourselves and others through huge, huge changes and small changes is the idea of resilience. And so there, the, one of the books that I, I really like on this is called The Resilience Factor. Um, and this is a quote from that, but resilience is the capacity to respond in healthy and productive ways when faced with adversity or trauma. It's essential for managing the daily stresses of life. We've come to realize in their research that the same set of resilient skills are as important to broadening and enriching one's life as they are to recovering from setbacks. Um, and so I think that's important to know because sometimes we think about resilience as something we need when things are tough, but if we really pay attention to it, it just helps us enrich our lives. We, we have a better outlook. We just, we probably have better health, all of those kinds of things, less stress are impacted by um, our, our personal resilience and how we grow that. Um, so here are a few things that I've learned. And I, I mentioned earlier that I learned a couple of these um, from a, a woman named Dr. Gretchen Diem um, at Meritor. She's a health psychologist. So I believe, I believe in giving credit where credit is due. But um, this first one, I know we always hear in terms of resilience and stress, like take a deep breath, you'll be fine. You know, this is a very deliberate um, act. And um, when Dr. Diem was originally using this with one of our other physicians, they were actually teaching it to physicians um, and then it moved into um, nursing, I believe. I know I used it a lot when I was working with, with clinical units. And the example we would use there, which I know not everybody can relate to, but think about something that's really stressful where you're like, huh. um, let's say they had been in with a really difficult patient or maybe a very traumatic situation or whatever it might be. And now they're, they are going to that next room. Before you enter that room, you don't have a lot of time. You don't need a lot of time for this. 
But the idea was, and if you, I can't see you, but if you want to stand and do this with me, I'm just going to remain seated. But whether you're seated or standing, the idea in this case was they were standing, just take a moment and stop. Feel your feet, like just sort of be conscious, feel your feet on the floor, whether you're seated or standing. And then I'm going to lead you through this literally right now is you take a very deliberate and slow five count breath in and hold it. And I'll count in a moment. And then the important part is when you let that breath out to do it also very deliberately because you are literally engaging and relaxing your body so that you can then enter that next room calm instead of the stress that you just felt. I use this all the time when I'm feeling a little stressed about and because it doesn't take a lot of time. I don't have time to maybe go take a class or go stretch or do yoga, but I always have time to just stop. So I'm gonna count you through it. If you're playing long, just feel both feet on the floor for just a moment. And then I'm going to count. So take a nice, deep, deliberate breath in. One, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four, five. And you have literally just engaged your relaxation response. That is a simple um, tool for resilience. Two feet, one breath. Sharing appreciation. I think sometimes we get so in our heads about stuff that if we just stop sometimes to recognize something somebody else did or even sharing appreciation for what a nice day it is, which I know sounds trite, but it's true. Um, or something that I can either, if I'm just by myself, just say, okay, what's something I really appreciate that's, ha that's happened today or about myself or about how I'm handling this? Um, or if, again, if you're working with a coworker or your leader or a team, um, what's something that, that, has, that you really appreciate about how this is working? Um, so share appreciation, intentionally reframe. Um, I go back to, you know, when we're helping somebody else um, doing reflective listening, Sometimes that next step is kind of taking it and asking the, not the but question. Um, I try to discourage people from using this but that because I learned this years ago. Um, do you know what but actually stands for? Behold the underlying truth. So we say something and if we use but, then it's kind of, well, ignore that because this. So use and, be really conscious about when you're reframing things, because this is, let's say we've got a new system, we're introducing whatever it might be, um, or you know, I'm thinking about going back into my office and I don't know how that's gonna go and should I do part-time, should I go back full-time, what am I gonna do right now? Those kinds of, whatever the decision is, I can say um, that's, I'm really concerned about that and, there's some good things about it because I'll have better access to get the idea. So intentionally reframing and being very conscious when you reframe um, something negative into something more positive to use and instead of but. Prioritize your self-care. Um, I know that that's so many of us sort of, if, especially if you've got a family, you've got whatever. Um, but but even if you don't, I. We, we sometimes think we're being selfish if we just take a time out, just go relax, do that deep breathing, go for a walk if you can, take a quick break, take care of yourself, um, because that gives you the resilience to continue um, on and to be able to continue to deal with the, the changes that are coming at you. And so for that, I'm going to give you um, another technique that I learned from Dr. Diem um, called the GLAD technique. And she actually not only taught this, but she put into practice, she had fairly young kids at the time. And when they would um, have dinner together at night, um, they would go around the table and use this GLAD technique to have their conversation. And she said it was just, at first she got a few eye rolls from her kids, of course, but she said, then they kind of 
went through their day like thinking about what they could share. And um, so again, you can do this by yourself. You can do it in a team, in your family, whatever. And here's what the GLAD technique is. You just share one thing that you're grateful for today. So maybe that's a little like the sharing appreciation, but what, what's one thing that you are grateful for today? That's the G. The L is one thing you learned about yourself or someone else today. Or if, you know, they were at work or in school, like just what's one thing you learned today? Maybe you tried something new or whatever. What's one thing you learned today is the L. What's one thing you accomplished today? And that doesn't have to be a big thing. Um, it can be something really small. Like I, I'll share mine and you're, this is kind of a good chuckle, but I was home yesterday, which I'm not home every day, but I was home yesterday and it was kind of icky weather and whatnot. And I did, had one of those days where I did those things that you always get annoyed about, but you never actually stop and fix them. So like the big, anybody have a big junk drawer in your kitchen? I did too. Mine's clean and organized. Thank you very much. Um, so I did a couple of those projects yesterday and it was like, huh, that felt really good. So what did you, I accomplished that yesterday. That was about it for me, but it felt good. Um, and then what's the one thing that delighted you today or made you happy or made you smile? Um, and so that's the glad technique. I just, I, it's so powerful. It's so simple, but it's what a way to either end your day or begin your day. You know, some people do gratitude journals. Um, I tried one of those for a while, but what I did with it is I kept it in my office and I would start my day. Um, I'd look at my calendar. I'd think about who I was going to be meeting with, what is me. And I would write down like three things I knew I was going to, that I was looking forward to being grateful for that day. I did, that was just my thing. Um, a lot of people do a gratitude journal or even just a very conscious thing before they go to bed at night. And so this GLAD technique can give you a way to do that. Or if you want to use it like Gretchen and Diem did, do it over dinner if you have dinner together. Um, so those are some resilience um, tools that I wanted to share. So I'm going to give you just a couple of minutes. We are almost um, time's up. But again, to, if you've got a place to take some notes or just, you know, in your phone, write a note, um, how will you navigate through the uncertainties? It's not going anywhere. Um, and how will you recalculate a little bit? Um, so as you think back on all the things we've talked about and uh, that I've talked about, what tools, what questions, maybe an idea from today's workshop that you think would be helpful to you to put into use when you need to kind of recalculate your route um, when things are uncertain. So let me give you just a couple of minutes to think about it. Take some, uh, take some notes for yourself um, and then... I'll see if there are additional questions and just close. All right, that may or may not have been long enough, but you can keep writing. Um, so I just wanted to just add at the end here, um, we'll, and we'll see if there's additional questions or anything people wanted to bring up, Andy, but just thank you to everyone for attending today. Um, I hope it's been helpful. Um, this is a topic that I'm, I'm just so passionate about and have worked with and, and just so thankful for the opportunity to share this with you um, and hope that it's helpful. Um, Andy told me, I, I told me prior to us starting that there were 117 people registered for this. So that tells me that it's a topic that people are, are feeling the need for. And so I really hope that um, you found it useful and engaging and practical, that you got some things that you can really take and use to, to help yourself through the changes you're experiencing. Um, I did put um, my contact info um, at the, on the left, it's on my left. Um, that you can feel free to email me if you want a copy of um, any of the handouts or that article or anything. 
Um, or you can just find me on LinkedIn and connect there and ask me to share something with you. I'm happy to do that. Um, so that's all I have for you today. And, and I wish you well um, in the midst of all this um, uncertainty and change. We got this. We can do this. We've done it before and we can do it again. So I'll leave on that. Other than, Andy, any other comments or questions from the group to address? So lots of praise coming in from folks. Um, so lots of thank yous and, and um, you know, giving, uh, um, stating how, how uh, um, much this is going to help folks. In the, Good. In their, their thank practice. you for that. So great takeaways. But no, it doesn't look like any questions um, okay. um, at this time. Good. So I, I went and put in uh, your email address in the comments as well so that people have oh, easy access to do to Excellent. have access to that, um, even the folks who are watching this uh, after as well. Um, okay. But with that being said, though, we'll go ahead and, and, and cap it there. I want to thank everyone okay. for for tuning in today, taking uh, you know the, the noon hour and spending it uh, with Dream Bank and, and Lori here. Uh, thank you, Lori, for putting together this wonderful presentation. Lots you are time. very welcome. It was my pleasure, and thank you again to everybody for attending. Absolutely. So yeah, we will go ahead and cap it there, and we will see you all, right. all next time. Take good care, all.